So, guys, I'm excited to be with you today. Uh, as you saw, the riveting title of my talk is Opening Remarks. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, I mean, I can basically go anywhere. But what I want to tell you guys is... First of all, I'm excited about being back here. How many of you guys are excited after all this time be back here? Be together. I mean, we've already said, if we, if we just stopped and went home now, I, I mean, we've had some great interaction. I mean, some of the sessions that went on yesterday, the, the mastermind group. How many people are in here who are part of the Unfair Advantage Mastermind? Can I see your hands? Awesome, awesome. Man, that was just, I could just see the energy just pushing out of that room. So... So that's cool, but here's the good news. We're not done. So we still got a full day today, a fun day tomorrow, and then the gala on Saturday night. So really what I'm charged with today is just to challenge you, as my coach challenged me back in 1986, to get from the day. Mr. Rohn said, basically, because I felt like he was talking to me, Michael, how will you get from the day? Now, I didn't understand what he meant in 86, but it didn't take me long. He was challenging me to become a better student and to never stop being a student. And I know many of you in this room, and that's the category you fall into. Continuing education. But I'm telling these guys up here on the front that we never get out of school, right? I mean, we get out of school, but we never stop learning. And to me, that's the great thing about what we do, about being an entrepreneur, being a captain of enterprise, as I love to refer to it. So let me share a quick story with you. Some of you guys have heard me tell this story before, but it's one of my favorites. So I'm going to tell it again. In 1994, there was a group of masterminds, a meeting of the minds in Orlando at Disney. They're all sitting around trying to come up with the next big idea, like Disney has done over all these years. And so, you know, they're throwing out this idea and that idea, and, and somebody says, I got a great idea. How about we take the kids' movie, Lion King, and turn it into a Broadway play? Yeah, that's it. What do you think? And could you just suppose in that room of experienced, intelligent, master minds, that that idea, a kid's movie, Broadway, spend millions of dollars, take a huge risk, don't really know how it's going to go. Could you suppose it was met with just a bit of resistance? And this means yes. Of course. In fact, one guy was even so bold, he stood up and he said, that is the worst idea in the world. I mean, don't you just love it when you can say what you really think? Fast forward three years later, not only does Lion King become a Broadway play, it wins six of the 11 Tony Awards it's nominated for. To date, it is the single highest grossing show on Broadway. In 2014, it became the top earning play in history, eclipsing Phantom of the Opera. Over eight thousand performances, over eight billion dollars, and in 2019, over a hundred million people had seen The Lion King on stage. Not too bad for the worst idea in the world. So you're going to hear some things today. You're going to see some things today. You say, well, maybe I've heard that before. I don't know. I don't think that'll work. Here's my challenge to you. When presented with new information and new ideas, capture now. Decide later. There's plenty of time to decide whether or not something you hear today is a good idea or not. For you and your business, for you and your life. So just capture it and then we can decide. Because if they would have decided too soon on the worst idea in the world, we'd have been robbed. History would have been rewritten. How many people have seen The Lion King on Broadway? Or on stage, Broadway play? Yeah, because it's been in Charlotte several times. Yeah, if you haven't, you should go. 
It is probably one of the ma most amazing stage performances you'll ever see. So today we're kind of charged with finding the answers because a lot of things have changed since we were together the last time, yes? Yeah, so what everybody thinks they want are the answers. But here's what I've found just as a student trying to make Mr. Rohn proud over all these years. Finding the answers is really about asking better questions because that is where the treasure is buried. That's where all the answers lie. So who do you follow? Where do you get your ideas and inspiration? How are you implementing them? And when was the last time you did something for the first time? Because we were, most all of us, thrust into that last one, right? How many of you guys had ever done a Zoom call before uh, a year and a half ago? And now how many of you guys are Zoom pros? You're like, Zoom call, man, I got it, right? Right? So that's just one example of how we grab hold of the future, how we can bend things in our direction, how we can change what's going on in the marketplace. And I know you can do it because I've seen it happen before. I've been around this group for 20 or so years, and just amazing. So some of you guys, as we go through 2020, and one of the questions that, that we've always asked in, in coaching and speaking and consulting is, what would you change about your life or your work if you could? And last year, a lot of people went to work on that question, right? A lot of people changed a lot of things in the last year or year and a half in their work and in their life. And that's cool. So I was reading not long ago a, a Bank of America report on the pandemic. And that report said that we, in essence, had about 10 years of change in 90 days. I mean, I hadn't really thought about that, but 10 years of change in 90 days. We were forced, in many cases, to change, to adapt, to adjust, trying to accelerate. So here's the question. What would I personally be, will, be willing to do or change or become if I could see remarkable results for me in my life or me in my work? What would I be willing to do? Well, first of all, here you are. Congratulations. Hats off to all of you for being here, for making the commitment. So just so you know, because some of you know me, and some of you may not know me or may not know me in this role, but since 2004, as Master of Ceremonies of the National Quality Dealer Awards, I've literally had the opportunity to sit down face-to-face -face with hundreds of the top dealers from all over the country and just talk with them and hear their stories. It's inspiring. That's been my great pleasure to be in that seat. We often ask the question, what's the value of a single idea? And when I asked that question to one of the state quality dealers several years ago, he thought for just a couple of moments, and then he said, I can answer that. What's the value of a single idea? About $16 million. And I said, wow. Do you mind if I ask what the idea is? And I can tell you today, for many of you, it would be a big letdown. It was just a buy here, pay here dealer starting to charge interest on his notes. It's easy for us to look back and say, well, that's pretty ridiculous, you know. But at the time, it was something he wasn't doing. And just by doing that single thing, implementing one new idea, he knew the value. $16 million. So we don't always get uh, an equation that's quite that easy. But while a lot of you know me as a master of ceremonies, that's really only a part of what I do. I've spoken to literally uh, a thousand audiences over the last 20 years, all across the marketplace in so many different industries. And that's the great thing that I've seen is sometimes industries get great ideas from across the marketplace, from another industry totally unrelated. 
So that's my challenge to you today is just keep an open mind. Just stay available to that idea that could strike you, even if it's from another industry. I had the opportunity and, and a great pleasure to work with Dan Kennedy. Anybody know who Dan Kennedy is? Yeah, it, it, you might want to look him up. I mean, he's probably the marketing guru once upon a time. He basically invented the infomercial. And Dan was always drilling into us about marketing is number one. Marketing is number one. And it was my great pleasure to be around him for a couple of years behind the curtain and see what he did from a marketing standpoint. It led me to doing a coaching and mastermind program for dealers in 2009 that some people in this room were a part of. And I got this cool piece of paper at the end saying I was the international business coach of the year because of the relationship and, and, and the position that I was in with captains of enterprise like you. So that was cool for me. But I share all that to say, let's come back to the same question. What would I be willing to do or change or become to see remarkable results? And really, commitment is the key. It's a book I wrote back in 2005. This gentleman right here, Michael. Joe. Hey, Joe, good to see you, man. You're sitting right here. You're going to get a book. Thank you, sir. Okay, you guys, I'll be right with you. There you go. Yes, sir. How about a hand for Joe? So I'm going to share with you a little marketing principle, what that's all about in just a minute. When was the last time you did something for the first time? Well, typically it's when we face a huge obstacle, right? There's this cool book, Glenn Booth, who you're going to hear from later today. I would encourage you, do not miss Glenn's session. Glenn said, you need to get this book by Ryan Holiday. It's called The Obstacle is the Way. Fantastic. Anybody read it? Mr. Myers, I wouldn't be surprised at that. The Obstacle is the Way. That is truth. Because what I found is when hurdles and obstacles get placed in the way, entrepreneurs find a way. They find a way to go over it or around it or right through it. The obstacle is the way. Here's what Ryan says in that book. He says, mediocre or bad companies are destroyed by a crisis. Look around. Sometimes no fault of your own. We're just riding the wave out. Think back to what we talked about. Ten years of change in 90 days. Many of those businesses would have gone out of business in seven or eight years. But they went out of business in 90 days. In, in large part through no fault of their own. And I'm not blaming any business. I'm just saying, when I read this by Ryan Holiday, I was provoked to find out what does he mean. He went on to say, while mediocre or bad companies are destroyed by crisis, good companies somehow survive and make it through. But great companies accelerate, they adapt, they improve because of that obstacle or crisis. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why you're here. In case you didn't know, there could be one thing that you get today that improves or accelerates your business or your life. And it's really just about upgrading. I mean, I look around in this room, I know there's some people who used a pay phone once upon a time. You carried dimes and then you carried quarters. Right? And we try to pull up close to it. It's kind of like checking your mail without scraping your, rear view, I mean your uh, side view mirrors. We did the same thing with pay phone. Get in here as close as I can. And the cord was only about this long, and it was heavy metal, so you're not stretching it anywhere. But when I talk to companies and organizations in a consulting or a coaching role, these are the four questions that we start with. What are we doing? What should we be doing? What should we be doing next? And then number four, what should we not be doing? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but is there anybody in this room, you're doing something in your business right now, and you know we should not be doing that. You'd be amazed how many times consulting clients, the answer to number one, what are we doing, and number four, what should we not be doing, were the 
same. Time to change. That's a hurdle. That's an obstacle. So it's really easy to move to the 5%. How do you do it? Well, here's one way. Just by reading two business books a year. David Norris says in Relationship Economics, less than 5% of our population reads more than one business book a year. I mean, that's just mind-blowing to me. But there's a revolution going on out there. You don't need me to tell you that. You're going to read and you're going to hear and you're going to see all about the data. And you're going to see some of that today, and that's great. Data is a good thing. It's what Jim Collins called all the way back in 2000 in his book, Good to Great, a technology accelerator. AI is everywhere. Alexa is famous. Right? The single name, Elvis, Alexa. Everybody knows them both. But when you hear that this is a data-driven marketplace, don't you believe it. This is a leader-driven marketplace. Data's great, but data is a tool. Somebody still has to fly the plane. Somebody still has to inspire other people. Somebody has to coach them to get the most from them, to improve their performance, the people around you. In a recent survey, one in five CEOs said there was not a single manager in their organization who could replace them. They don't understand other people well enough, they don't solve problems, or grow or develop quickly enough, and they do not take the necessary risks. That is what leaders do. And that is why this marketplace is leader-driven and not data-driven. Data is simply a tool that leaders use to accelerate the growth and the performance of the individuals around them and their business. What if to truly lift, accelerate, and advance your team as top selling performers and differentiate you and your company from everybody else in the marketplace, all you needed to provide was a measure of inspiration and ideas and a little coaching. Wouldn't that be cool? Inspiration, ideas, and coaching. How and where and who? It, it mystifies me why in most categories all across the marketplace, business people do business without a coach. When we can look in every other area of the marketplace, from Hollywood to performing arts to the Olympics, you name it, they all have coaches, but not in business. That's how you get in the 5%. Right? That's what entrepreneurs do. They seek out better ways, greater ways, faster ways to do what they do. They don't rest on the status quo because they know in an instant the status quo could be wiped out. We just saw it. So if you did focus on marketing, I'll give you just a couple of ideas. Capitalize on the power of print. How many of you guys have a business card? Now, if you're sitting on the first couple rows here, you've got one of my business cards for CETV. It's got my picture on the back, CETV on the front. I've also got a banjo business card. Banjo on the back, me on the front. Phone number in case you want me to come and play. I've also got my speaker, coaching, consultant. Me on the front with a $100 bill and me on the back looking amazing. Right? You gotta have one of those action shots. But the cool thing is, when I started out, you know, all my business cards were like that. They were like that size. And then I thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool? Glenn remembers this. I got me one of those, in the beginning, rock solid training business cards. It's a four by six. And then I went to a six by eight, the Mr. Mastermind card several years later. But those don't compare to my business card today. That's my business card right there. Thank you, Wes Westmoreland at Westmoreland Printers for creating that. It's me on the front, me on the back. It's more me than most people can handle. But if I'm playing against ordinary business cards, who wins? 
I'm telling you, it's easy to do. It's pennies. Who does it? Almost nobody. Only the 5%. You get in a Dan Kennedy group, everybody's walking around with signboards as business cards. I mean, they're trying to outbig each other, right? But this is easy to do. Can you ever imagine handing one of these to somebody and then just taking it and putting it in their pocket? Is it, would that ever happen? I can tell you in 21 years, it's never happened. People go, oh my gosh, that's huge. I, I, I don't even know where I can put that. That's, uh, I guess I'll just walk around with it. People see, oh, what do you got there? Oh, it's a Michael York business card. Yeah, I got one too. I slid it in the back of my pants here. I, right? I mean, it's just, it's available. Why wouldn't you do it? Give greater access to you. How do you do that? I'm in Moody Gardens speaking for the Texas Independent Auto Dealers Association, and I'm walking back to my room one night, and I look in the window, and here's the sign. In the event of a gift or fashion emergency, call, bop, 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 and the phone number. Jody, I've never seen anything, and I've never seen it since. In the event of a gift or fashion emergency, anybody ever have one? Where's Larry? Is he in here? Larry had a fashion emergency this morning. I mean, he was ready for it. But, so the next day I couldn't resist. I went in the shop and I asked the owner, I said, that is such a cool sign because I'm a marketing geek, I guess, is what I've been accused of. I said, that's such a cool sign. Does anybody ever call you? He said, Michael, you would not believe it. We get calls all the time. And nobody comes in to buy a $8 something. What are they buying? Hundreds or thousands. And he told me like three or four stories. I'm like, that's awesome. In the event of after fashion emergency. So one of my clients, I told him, I was, I was speaking at, uh, in Amelia Island at the Ritz-Carlton. And I walk into the bathroom and I'm like, dang. Now I know Ritz-Carlton's like, but that bathroom, if you ever go there, you should go to Amelia Island just to see the bathroom at the Ritz-Carlton. That's how awesome it is. It's what I call now bathroom marketing. Because people go into this client's bathroom, it's got mouthwash, it's got the little white cups, it's got all that stuff. It's awesome. And does, does anybody make a comment about it? Yes, over and over and over and over. Does anybody use the mouthwash? They run out on a weekly basis. Mints, they're gone. Right? So you didn't know what you didn't know. You didn't think that was a big bathroom marketing. What are you talking about? He would never go back. You can go live on Facebook. Just you, hey, what's up? We're walking the lot here. And it's, right? I did a little thing, a little banjo thing with a friend of mine. He wanted to do a Facebook Live because all the live events had been canceled. We did it. We went live on Facebook. Over 1,000 people are watching us playing guitar and banjo. I thought, wow, that'd be cool if we were selling something. Right? Your own TV channel right in your pocket. Get this book. This is marketing, Seth Godin. What would it do for you if you got the Ryan Holiday book and the Seth Godin book? You're in the 5%. That's two business books a year. What is that noise? That's my granddaughter say. What's that noise? I'm out of time. So, there's a lot of ways we can change the how. There's a lot of ways we can be more resilient. We can become relentlessly positive. Because bad news is normal. It's acceptable, it's unquestioned, and it's coming at you every day. So we got to be ready for it. Create value, give it away. People will be attracted to you, find a way to make it pay. My free offer to you is this. The selling idea, which is the think book, my nine ways to beat price. Digital copy of the Ten Commitments. And today's slides if you want them. Here's the address, mycoach20.com, mycoach20.com. I'm not selling anything. You'll have to kind of skip by the, I want Michael to be my coach and spend thousands of dollars. Just skip past that or not. But go right to the free stuff, and here's what it's going to look like. Michael's free offer. Thanks for wanting more. It's about $300. We've sold it over the years to different groups. So $300 with the free stuff if you care. If you don't. It's okay. But let me just, by way of a little commercial, let you know about the sign out in the lobby there. There's going to be cigars by the beach tonight after the expo. 
And I'm going to be hosting with a good friend of mine, the Czar of Cigar. Love to see you there. Guys, have a remarkable day because you can. I appreciate your time. Thanks for being here. I'm Michael Gillard.